Amanda, we both know what TBRI is, Trust-Based Relational Intervention. Can you explain it a bit more exactly what it is? Absolutely. Um, TBRI is a holistic intervention. So that means we look at the whole child, the whole family, the whole system. Um, A lot of times in child welfare, we really kind of differentiate different parts of the child. And we don't believe that healing can happen unless we're looking at the whole child, body, mind, spirit, emotions, right? All of those things together. Um, It's also attachment rich, right? So it's based in attachment and the science behind attachment. We don't believe healing can happen without understanding attachment um, and creating secure connections for kids. Um, And then it's trauma informed, right? So in TBRI, we are specifically talking about how trauma has affected the brain, the body, the biology, the behavior and the belief system of children and adults, right? So understanding that trauma has affected each of the five B's as we call them. Um, And then lastly, we are um, research-based or evidenced. Um, And so there's evidence, there's a lot of research that has gone into TBRI and we can show that this helps to grow healthy brains. It helps to heal trauma in the brain and body of children and adults. Great, such great work. And if someone needs your services, where do they go? Yeah, so to find out more about TBRI, you can go to our website. Um, It's the Karen Purvis Institute of Child Development, and you can find that at child.tcu.edu. Great. Amanda, I've always been fascinated by the attachment. So apparently there are four divisions of attachment styles. Can you just give us, I know this is a big uh, discussion, but just a brief synopsis of what our attachment styles are. Yeah, absolutely. To completely oversimplify simplify <laughs> attachment, um, we, we really look at it in four ways. So secure attachment is that gold standard. So when we talk about that cycle, right, that means that someone came and didn't just meet my physical needs as an infant, but they met my emotional needs as well. Um, and so from a secure attachment, what I gain as a child and I take into adulthood um, is that I can negotiate my needs right? So I can say what I need and do that in an appropriate way. Um, and that I can be attuned to other people. Right. Um, and so we have markers of secure attachment, um, but secure attachment is what we're going for. Then there are three other styles. Two of them are organized like secure attachment within the brain, which means when X happens, my brain responds with Y. Um, So those are organized styles of attachment. The first of those is dismissive. And the pattern there is that when I cried as an infant, my physical needs were usually met, um, but oftentimes my emotional needs were not. Um, And so as a result, what I learned early on is that my voice doesn't matter. And so to, in order to get my needs met, I have to behave a certain way. And so in, in adulthood, what dismissive looks like, and I can speak to this because I'm just, I grew up dismissive. Um, but in adulthood, what this looks like is I've learned that things are more reliable than people, right? So um, as a child, rather than my, let's say my mom providing comfort for me, um, maybe I had a thing that provided comfort or she would give me a toy or, right? And she would, she didn't provide the comfort for me. And so I learned early on to to seek comfort, I have a thing. And so that looks like um, maybe after a stressful day at work, I want to go shopping. iPad. (laughs) Right. Or I go to the iPad, right. Or for me, like I want to go shopping. Right. And the way that I want to provide care is to give you great things. Right. So I can cook you an organic bento box lunch with all the best foods and the best. And I have all the right oils and I have all the right. Right. And I have all the right things to provide healing. Right. I'll get you the best school, the best therapist, the best, all those things. Um, But if you need me to just sit in the, uh, in the horrible sadness of your story, I don't have the emotional intelligence to do that. Yeah. Right. Because I learned that for hard things, we sweep those under the rug, right? We pull up our boots and we move yeah. on, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. We don't talk about hard things. We don't complain, right? We don't cry. Usually as a dismissive adult, we actually wear like the last time we cried as like a, a button of like, Oh, I haven't cried since 2000. Right. <laughs> like, it's like this great, because we, wanna. Yeah. Yeah. And like, we've learned, we learned early on, like, that's not how you get your needs met. Right. That's weakness. 
Yes. Um, and so being dismissive as, as an adult looks like I'm going to provide all the right things for my children, for my spouse, for my friends, but to be with them, to sit in hurt, to sit in uncomfortable spaces with them. I don't know how to do that. It's not that I don't want to, right? It's not that I don't want to be there for my children emotionally. It's not that I don't want them to come to me after they've had a hard day. I don't know how to do those things because it was never modeled for me. Um, So that's that dismissive. Um, And I'm, again, no um, guilt or shame for parents because we're all doing, right? Yes, Yes, and exactly what we were taught. Yeah. Right. Research shows that about 85% of us have the same attachment style as our grandmothers and great grandmothers. Right. So again, when we talk about the cycle, right, this is where that comes from. Um, I know how to comfort a baby because someone comforted me. Right. Um, and then there's the entangled adult attachment style. And what that looked like as an infant was like this real push and pull. Sometimes I would cry and my caregiver would be emotionally and physically available to me. And sometimes they wouldn't. So as a result, I learned to just keep crying, right. To not be easily soothed so that I wouldn't lose the attention of my caregiver. Cause if I lost the attention of my caregiver, I didn't know if next time they would be there for me both physically and emotionally. So I stayed upset, right? So as an adult, this looks like someone who, um, I, I always like use an example of one of my friends where the first time, you know how like you have a girlfriend and you're like, okay, it's time to bring our husbands together, right? It's like the next step of your relationship, right? <laughs> like as, a fr- as friends and adults, yeah. like, okay, we're gonna see if we can be couple friends, right? And it's this big step. And so we brought our husbands together for the first time and we were at dinner and they were asking about a vacation we were going on. And um, my friend said, oh, we should go with you guys. And I was like, no, I don't even know if my husband likes your husband yet. (laughs) But they just jump in, right? It was like your girlfriend in college where like she went on a first date last week and this week she's moving in with him, right? And you're like, wait, we don't know him yet, right? But they just jump in with both feet. Um, They're like really, really, we would say like too hard, too fast, right? So it's impulsive and needy? Right. And ultimately it becomes this push pull. Right. So when we think about um, their relationship, you might talk to your friend and in the morning, everything's great with her and her new live in boyfriend. Right. And in the afternoon, they're fighting. And in the evening, everything's back to normal. Right. And it's this constant push and pull like the infant who has to remain upset to stay in the attention of their caregiver. Right. And adult relationships that might look like I have to create drama to make sure that we're still say drama. I know exactly. I know friends that always have to have drama. Right. And like, so for me, as I grew up dismissive, I always know right away, oh, that person's entangled, right? Because it's almost the opposite of what I would do, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas I've learned like, oh, you don't share negative feelings. You keep that quiet. I think I might be in that category. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. But they do the opposite, right? Yes. So if we were to ask them now about their mom, they might tell you about a time, you know, they were a senior in high school and she showed up at prom and, you know, they're still upset about it. Right. right? And you and I might be like, uh, that was 30 years ago. Like, let's move Move on. on. (laughs) Right. But they're, they're still entangled. Got it. Um, so that's that. The the third, what's the fourth? The last one is, um, unresolved. And what that really looks like is, um, So that is not an organized attachment style. So the other three we've talked about, you can see those patterns in the brain. What happens with unresolved attachment is as an infant, what's happened is there's two parts of our brain. First, there's this reptilian part of our brain that says, when you're afraid, run away. And then there's this mammalian part of our brain that says, when you're afraid, run to your primary caregiver, right? To seek safety. Okay. So we have those two wirings in our brain. And as infants, if what we were afraid of was our primary caregiver, right? So our brain said, run away from this Mm -hmm. and run to your primary caregiver. But what we were afraid of was our primary caregiver. We literally see disorganization or fracturing in the brain. And so that's where we get things like um, when someone can dissociate right? Or that type of thing. We can watch that happen in the brain 
through that happening. Because when those two things are happening in the brain at the same time, um, it's like bleach to the brain. The chemicals and the hormones that are released actually almost separate that prefrontal cortex or that rational part of the brain from the survival part of the brain. Um, and so as a result, that's why for many of our children who have experienced trauma, their behaviors don't make sense to us. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like we'll say, if you're hungry, why are you punching a hole in the wall? Yeah, yeah. Right. Like if you stole food, I would at least understand, oh, you're hungry. Right. But their behaviors don't make sense. It's not because they're trying to manipulate or trying to confuse us. It's because their brains literally fracture and you can't predict what's going to happen. Um, and so that is that unresolved trauma as an adult. And so for those caregivers um, who are unresolved, we'll often see that they'll check out right when caregiving like a child will do something and they'll maybe dissociate or they'll act as if they're the child suddenly, right? Or we'll see some of those behaviors that seem very scary or strange um, to those of us who are observing um, when in fact it, they can't help it, right? Their brain is dissociating. Um, but I wanna say the beauty and the hope in all of this attachment stuff is that first of all, the brain remains plastic throughout a lifetime. And so it's never ever, too late to create a secure attachment That's for right. yourself or for a child that you work with, serve, live with, give care to. It's never too late. I love hearing that. And, you know, it's so, it's so interesting to me. You say that generational, the grandmother, the great grandmother, they just pass it on, but you can stop that generational. If it's a dysfunction, you can change it. The work of healing is really brave work. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because you're carrying those generations of trauma, of abuse, of hurt, of neglect. And you're saying it stops with me. Yeah. Right. And that will change every generation after you. And that's really brave and really powerful. And really uh, arduous work. Yeah, absolutely. Amanda, because of the pandemic, mental health issues is such a big deal. Um, for both adults and I think especially teens. And these are the years where socialization is so important and kids are online. How, I mean, it's hard enough for kids that are in safe, secure families. How do you see the mental health of these children that are in foster care or transitioning, those sort of kids? Yeah. What's your outlook on that? Yeah, Deb, I think this is part of um, the things that we'll only know years from now, the effects of this pandemic. Yeah. Um, but it's heartbreaking uh, to hear from many hospitals across the nation that we work with um, who have, you know, they used to have one floor of mental health patients and now every floor is mental health because of what we know about attachment, because of what we know about the strength of relationships, we are designed, we are built to need relationships. Um, and so when, when we have to, right, um, keep ourselves safe and those types of things and stay away um, from our friends and family, and um, it's devastating for all of us. For us as adults, it's devastating. But for a brain that's developing, um, it's even more devastating. Yeah. And so and a lot of them are not sort of, uh, well, they, they are talking to their friends, but a lot, I think, are just going into the more into the social media, which I know has its own challenges. Mm -hmm. So it's the social media or just zoning out into video game land and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. We've seen it in our home. Um, and so we've, the thing for our family that I just encourage everyone is like, this is a time to practice grace right? Grace for ourselves, grace for each other, um, and connection. So I have three teenagers. Um, and so we created like a two hour time span in the evening where everybody turns off all devices. Um, wow. And we, and they listen to you. Well, they don't really have a choice, but you know, some days it's harder than others, but we make it fun, right? We have dinner together and then, and it's not every night, um, but then we invested, we didn't really have board games or puzzles or any of that, but we're like, we're going to do fun stuff together. You can invite, you know, whoever you want to join you on whatever social media you want during the day. But these two hours, cool. we're going to connect as a family. I have um, to say that, you know, the, uh, as tragic as this pandemic has been, it affected people's livelihoods and health and all that stuff. There's always the cloud of silver linings to me. I've found for our family, we've, you know, we, you have to go in and it's like, 
priorities have become more clear and like we've really shifted up and we've really become closer as a family because we are you're you're all pushed together and you've got to get on with it and I think it's actually been a a great thing for us to really connect on deeper levels so I I agree and attachment language I think it's forced attunement again for all okay yeah. Where you know we used to be attuned to our infants, right? We had to be. We'd be like, oh, that's the poop face, or that's the hungry yeah. cry, or that's the right. And we knew all those things. And then as our kids get older and leave the nest and you know, do all those things, some of that attunement is lost. And this pandemic has helped, at least in our family, to really increase that level of attunement, right? I agree. We're having much more profound chats with the kids, like they're really sharing, having a big picture view of the world, and it's been great. Yeah. So although it's been awful in many ways, I agree. There are some strengths that we're seeing. um, Absolutely. And we dance together. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) I make them dance. Oh, I love that. I love that. (laughs) It's always fun. Dance party will solve anything. We actually. (laughs) That's actually proven um, through research that like when we get. Of course. Physical. Yes. Like to shake. If you see like um, animals of prey who after they get chased like a life you know life or death situation after it's over you'll always see the animal shake um and that actually releases the calming neurotransmitters Ah. in their brains and bodies so a dance party will literally change the brain i I recommend a dance party that is my recommendation today every time (laughs) 